Hello, I'm Chris, this is Jeremiah, and you are listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hello and welcome back. I'm Chris. This is Jerem. Oh, pointing. It is me. Any, anyway, it's just it's the two of us. <laughs> it's just the two of us and we are uh, just recording a very brief episode because you just finished a big chunk of work. Yes, I did. Uh, finished the uh, production, post-production, and uh, final color mixing and uh, sound mix of my series called uh, Reginald Vampire coming out in October. Awesome. It's ba based on a series of books written by Johnny Truant called Fat Vampire. So in Germany, it'll probably be Grosse Vampire. I think. <laughs> Something along Here, those it's lines. Reginald the Vampire, and uh, but it was a lot of fun doing it. We have an amazing cast. The scripts are brilliant, and uh, I had a lot of fun with uh, design and image making. Um, had hired a, uh, a DP who I Kamal Darkawi, who I'd never worked with before, and it was just astonishingly great. He he had uh, he he was a Moroccan-born uh, Polish raised his parents i think ran the polish film school and then wow. he studied with a tarkovsky's a cinematographer in Moscow <laughs> before emigrating to canada and so his his breadth of knowledge is pretty significant and um you know i'm a great tarkovsky fan especially the visual so well so am i so <laughs> he had me at tarkovsky but, okay. um yeah so so and you know you and i should do an episode on tarkovsky oh, visuals. oh yes <laughs> Just, you know we could talk an hour on stalker alone but um easily <laughs> uh yeah so it, it was good and this being a photographic uh oriented podcast if anybody didn't notice um uh, i i thought i would kind of focus in on the kind of things I've been doing over the last few weeks, which is um, color timing. And, and it applies directly to, of course, the kinds of photo editing that we most often use, whether it's Photoshop or... What, what is color timing exactly? Color timing is where you take uh, the um, original output, in, in which case, uh, digitally, it would be sort of a, uh, a raw output, each particular camera manufacturer uh, has their own um, kind of nomenclature for what that would be. And it, it's like a digital negative. Right. In other words, it, it will just give you the, the widest range that the cameras are capable of. Uh, but there's no, quote, editorializing about them. Um, so that you, when, you, when you go to the uh, color suite, it would be very similar to putting a raw uh, picture up on, I use Photoshop or Lightroom. Uh, many don't. Um, I think you don't. Um, and, and then you can adjust everything. You so, can adjust. so would, that, would that be something along the lines of um, th this scene needs a warmer feeling, another mood, and the color does oh, that? Is yeah. That, 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 that's the that kind of decisions the you're talking about. Yes, it, it, it's like photo editing imagery, but you're doing it uh, at 24 frames, 25 frames uh, a second, and uh, the the requirements obviously of uh, computing power are a little bit higher, um, so, and yeah. tracking and tracking, of course, because uh, for example, you could. Uh, it's a lot more than just saying "give me warm, give me cold." I mean, I I'll go in and I'll say, you know, I just want to lift the highlights of the eye. Just ah, a little so bit. I get it. Yeah, so so we would build a soft edge mat around it. Um, I would adjust exactly what I want, and I'll explain how I do that or how we do that collectively. Um, and then uh, the computer, the suite, uh, creates a tracking mechanism so that it actually follows the the subject. Mm -hmm. But never loses sight of the of the mat, which obviously has a lot of feathering. And by feathering, I mean it's it decreases in intensity as it moves out to the borders. So it, right. it it's kind of an invisible line, though you can make it hard if you want. Um, 
and then you lay it down. Um, and, you know, I would do that. I mean, you, you, you are adjusting contrast, you're adjusting color, you're adjusting color luminosity, and I can go into what that is, for example. Oh, so, so if, if someone's holding a red umbrella and you, you'd say this needs to be, be more red in this scene, then you'd have a moving tracking mat that follows the umbrella and, and boosts the saturation and that kind of... Yeah, if, if for example, uh, the subject is standing in front or moving in front of a... Um, a medium gray background, mm -hmm. um, you can basically go, well, I, I want that gray background to be lifted uh, very specifically in terms of tone. Uh, but how do we get to that moment? Um, what we do is we create a, a luminosity mask. So you just grab the color from the background um, and then... Uh, you know, you transform that grab into a mat. So it only mats everything but the um, adjustable um, target. Uh, and then no matter what, where the subject goes in that shot, uh, mm -hmm. it applies that. And so it's, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, we used to do this when I first started. Uh, I started as a, a director of, television commercials in New York. And I used to go to Technicolor at like, if, if the call time was seven, I would be at the lab at like six <laughs> or five working in, you know, in Technicolor in those days in the basement. And they would run the previous day's dailies on a projector. And I would basically call out to the color timer Warmer, cooler, greener, redder. You know what I mean. Blah blah blah. Uh, you know, on the on the fly. You know, I I that that was that was my, my that was the vision in front of my inner eye. Like you have to be in a special facility. They have very very um, color stable, color accurate projectors and these kind of things. And you do it in a in a in a in a cinema type location, so you can do it on a big screen and. Uh, have lots of people around. Um, has that changed? I guess. It uh, has. Well, yes, it has changed. You know, just incredibly uh, to the benefit of all of us, uh, because when when you when you start to work in feature films, and you know, my first feature films were obviously shot on film, and we went through the same situation. But you would work there in a color suite with your color timer and. You'd always be uh, vying for, you know, the star color timer of the week, month, year uh, at the lab. I did a lot of work with Technicolor, so I'm familiar there, but I also at Deluxe. But um, you would go there, you would screen the whole movie silent, and you would, you would again, in real time, be calling out. And you sometimes you'd do it with the cinematographer and most often with the cinematographer and sometimes not, depending on schedule. Sometimes he had to get to the set to prep and... Mm -hmm. You, you would have that extra time. So um, you would call out to that um, color timer and he would make copious notes and the, the film would be running in real time. They wouldn't stop it. And then, then he would uh, apply those notes and create another print. So a few days later, uh, you would go in and do the same thing and you would do it over and over and over until you got the print that was Perfect. How many now, how many passes are we talking about? Two, oh, three, five, ten? Yeah, no more than five, no less okay. than two, that's for sure. Depending on how much conversation uh, you had ahead of time. How by the way, and how balanced the overall film was, how if it was lit consistency, if there was an overall mm -hmm. tonality to apply, if if it was jumping all over the place, which you want sometimes, uh, it would take longer because it's more specific. But it just uh, occurred to me that that my very first film, um, which I think I've mentioned here, I, you know, I had gone through that particular process. Also, I I cut it on a standing flat uh, uh, moviola, like a, <laughs> a very no. Large yeah, my my editor Jerry Greenberg, who died a few years ago, uh, had cut Bullet, and he's like an Academy Award with with that's how blades he grew, and things. Yeah, and that's how he he and I was like I had been working on flatbeds, and you know was quite I thought pretty sophisticated, and I was like mortified. But he the cuts are fantastic, and just another sidebar, I I um, 
at the Directors Guild dinner, you know, maybe 10 years ago or more, probably, uh, I had the opportunity to sit next to Robert Wise. Now, Robert Wise, great noir director, but also, a uh, little known fact, was the editor of Citizen Kane. And, oh, okay. um, and uh, over the years, I, I managed to, to ingratiate myself with him. <laughs> and so I could always sit next to him and ask him a, a, a variety of questions. But he started as an assistant and uh, you know, you could see in these, you know, maybe these, some of these older images of editors holding up film like that. Yes. Well, what they were doing is they were measuring seconds. Mm-hmm. They would go like, oh, this is ah, a second. Okay. This is a half a second. And they just <laughs> knew it. That's the rhythm of how they did it. And then they would like give it to their assistant. They would mark it. And give it. There, there was, you know, they did it without machines. Wow. That's so yeah, that's much how experience jo- in these kind of things. It's amazing. Amazing. And and you look at the rhythm of the cutting there. It's absolutely beautiful. So um, that that was kind of fun. Going back to the um, the subject at hand, color timing. Well, uh, I think I mentioned maybe um, a couple of months ago when I got back from location, Warner Brothers had called me in and to remaster uh, Christmas Vacation, which was my first movie, which I timed in a lab old school. And there I was in the color timing suite with my original negative up, the original negative, which wow. had been cleaned and digitized. That's the one that all the all the prints were made from then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all the all the main prints. Then they usually for the for the main theaters, they 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 make about maybe eight or nine master prints from the original negative and they put the original negative again not to be touched and then they make a right. submaster. So all the if you go to a theater in in Omaha, Nebraska, um, which may, they didn't consider say a, a pr- principal market and you you drop in just to see if the projection was okay you'd, and whatnot. You had like a third hey, copy or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, it was like <laughs> uh, it's a little bit grainier than I remember, and it's like the sound is not turned out. But I, uh, whenever I would travel, and if my movie was playing, I'd always drop in and go to the project. I, they let me in because I, I directed the movie. You know, I want to <laughs> see how it's running here. They'd let you. They would always be thrilled to have the director come in, and then I would immediately run <laughs> to the projection booth and go like, "Guys, it's out of focus," or like, "Turn it <laughs> up." Or, and, and of course they did, and uh, you know, registered my complaints always. Um, but here I was in the color suite, and we did the same on the sound mix, um, where I was able to recolor. Um, all using the latest technologies. It's a little bit like 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 Ansel Adams who who reprinted several of his negatives over and over again in like different contrasts and different exposures. Yeah, and and the thing is, you know, you don't want to lose the intention of the original movie because the not. fan base is. But also, you have a movie. few more years of experience under your belt now. Absolutely, but also uh, technical controls because before I was going like warmer, colder, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, just more general effect. Right. Uh, but here it was like, uh, you know, I, I literally want to lift up that little shadow area just on the lower right of frame, but I, I want to keep the other in, in, in total shadow. Or, you know, the silver that's on the disc, I want to just lift that a little bit and, and, and hit that highlight to near peaking. And, so you, you um, can now add detail that you've never, in fact, seen before, right? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. And when we were done, uh, and everyone there, one of the person who ran the session um, specifically on the sound end had, had been the sound design assistant on the original and, and remembered all of the details that I was shouting out way back when, but to sit and watch the movie as if for the first time and see things that you, you know, from the original where you knew that's what I saw in, in camera. And remember we're, we're, this is at the very beginning of sort of bad video feeds. So even, you know, you you were just getting a general image out of the uh, video tap. So recoloring that, um, you, you said the original negative, but you were now working on a digitized version of the original negative, right? Yes. What they did is they took it, cleaned it, uh, re- and then they, they of course, um, scanned it in 4K HDR, right. the, 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 or, or it could have been 6K HDR for a 4, 4K output. 
<laughs> and it and you know and spare no expense on that Warner stage. It is like whoa, who made this movie? This is did you, this did looks you have great. To employ, did you have to employ any special effects? Because I don't know, you would now be seeing details, flaws in oh, we, makeup, and that kind of stuff. Absolutely, uh, there were some wire removals that that uh, okay. I did not do for budgetary reasons on very quick shots. Right, yes. like no one's going to notice. Nobody ever noticed. Uh, but in now doing that, it all. Now they're gone. And so little things like that we were able to, to adjust. And uh, I think it, it, it will be seen and uh, they're going to re-release it in major markets in November. So that's exciting. Um, but going back to the um, process of color timing. Uh, it's something that I really do love, enjoy. My partner, <laughs> is, the writer, is like, oh, I can't, no, I don't, I don't want to. You know, he's more focused on the mix. Yeah. Of course, I'm there too, but uh, we both do the mix. But but um, this is, it, it is really, like, for example, to do this, and I'll, I'll describe the, the setup. Originally, I go, I flew up to Vancouver for a few days, Um and sat in the suite with the color timer for the first episode. And we arrived at the overall general look of the piece and then more specifically dialed it and dialed it until it was there. I brought my 12.5 uh, um, iPad Pro and uh, oh. for a reason because, and um, I used a, a software system uh, called uh, Streambox, and, and uh, I think that's what it's called. Anyway, it's a pick. But what I was able to do is match the color space, in other words, the controls of the iPad in terms of brightness, true tone being turned off, um, choosing the color space very specifically to match the color space on stage, the overall light levels on stage to match, And when it was dialed in so that there was literally no air between what I was seeing on my iPad and the screen, like absolutely pitch perfect in real time. So I would, I would say, let's do X. And on the screen, you see all these, you know, dials and whatnot come up. And on my, I see a mirror of that on my iPad. Wow. Uh, but I'm talking, you know, we're talking about nuanced detail like within you know a 0.25 stop you could you could just see it absolutely perfect then i come back to los angeles to here in venice and um for episode you know for the subsequent episodes i did one and two there making sure everything was consistent and set up then i flew back and and the color timer then would work for say a full week on each episode based on the overall instructions that I would give. Sometimes I'd send photos, screen grabs, and I would give them general notes so that they had spent a week dialing in the overall look. In other words, the contrast and the overall tone. And if we were repeating, uh, which we do on, on TV, some of the locations that are the same, mm -hmm. just ma making sure that there was a uh, uniformity to that. Uh, and then um, it's funny because in my house, I, 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 there's there's only one room that I can get any kind of darkness in, and that's my bedroom. Everything else is like. Phew. So, so you're, I, you're I, basically lying in bed with your iPad and doing the color. Yeah, time. not quite lying in bed, but I, I, I created a little kind of a corner desk, right? Let's, let's, um, say, let's say sitting on the sofa and doing that kind of work. Something like that. Sort of, and, yeah. and with all the curtains closed, everything, you know, matching it dimly, setting it up on the iPad, and then uh, opening a Zoom uh, with the stage so I could talk in real time to the, to the uh, color timer. Oh, so there was still a color timer in oh, the, the studio, yeah. The full crew. Full yeah. crew was there. Oh, I see. Um, and I'm there, and uh, just like we start to roll, and it's like we do one shot and you just just like I was present on stage. It that is was, a very that is a very COVID conform way to to work yes. on these kind of things. Wow. Well, it, I I think it developed out of that, and we have very similar on the on the sound mix too. I mean, we would go, we would use different different um, software 
uh, to kind of emulate what we were hearing on stage. Too. And then when you when you later go back to the studio and have a look at the finished work, it will be it is the same that you saw on your iPad. Yeah, I mean, what I've done, they 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 put together once that's locked with the mix, they put together the what they call the QC, you know, that the, the actual the thing that would go to a theater or the network. And they'll take a uh, an initial 720 output of that and put it on something called PIX, which is you know, very um, uh, restrictive in terms of the you know the the controls of who can watch it. Obviously, it's like gold to them. You know, it's very very. This is now their their baby. They don't want to leak it. You know, they'll send it to the New York Times or entertainment. You know what I mean? So it's. But I'll be able to check it just a 720, and it looked amazing. It looked fantastic. So, so a uh, virtual uh, is something that is you know it, re it, it did work out really really well. And also, we were working with a uh, effects team in South Africa uh -huh. called the Refinery. Absolutely dazzling place, um, and they did amazing work. And we would get on uh, with something called Evercast, which is a technology uh, a um, I guess a system that we would use for editing. So I would be editing in real time with my editor using Evercast. So again, all of these tools were effectively really um, nuanced during the pandemic. And now I think they're going to be the norm uh, because it was, it, it was absolutely a, a pleasure doing it. And, um, and the, the, I guess the amount of, of time and, and care w could even be, one could consider it even more efficient working virtually because, you know, the clock of, you know, flying you to wherever you have to be on stage and all the rest of it, especially since production now is like all over the world, used to be all in LA. So you just, you know, drive to the studio and do it. Now it's, <laughs> it's very different. Um, and, but with special effects, And screening effects and making notes on the screen, going, you know, the, I see a little spill here, that, and then that they get that back and turn it around, and and so uh, there's just, you know, I, I've just spent the last, you know, <laughs> many many months square eyed, staring at a monitor, and I look forward to a little bit of. <laughs> <laughs> real world time. nature nature yeah nature um so that's that's really it but the you know the process of color timing is something that i and i'm sure you uh is something i really do embrace i mean one of our episodes begins in black and white and then transforms to color sort of a, a call out to wizard of oz in a way and in, in yeah. one of them and you know just transforming that uh color you know, raw to a, a really effective classic a cinema look a la 1940, you know, or, you know, 50. It was, it was uh, just a lot of fun. And, and, um, you know, it, it, you know, it applies to our photography. So, um, you know, so significantly because, you know, you look at an image, you go like, Oh God, it, you know, it's like overcast and, And then you and flat, do some magic, and then you do some. And you just put it up there, it. and then all of a sudden, you know, the sky is a little more contrasty and threatening, or brighter. You know, the greens are a little pop, and and all of a sudden, you're you're effectively painting. Um, you know, you're 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 painting light color contrast. Pretty much uh, part of the work these days. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I. You know, I'm not one of these guys who ascribe to like no filters because when I was in in the dark room, I mean, dodging and burning. Oh, it's were part just, of the artistic process. Yeah, yeah, it's just just what you do, or how long you leave it in the in the developer, or you know how how agitated you make the um, the D76 or whatever the hell. How much you shake it? it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Shake it, don't break it. So. Um, Those are things that that have always been really part of my personal workflow, so I, I just adore it. 
Um, I, I, I get excited every time I put up an image. And, you know, the other day, I, I think I threw this on our little Discord where I was in Joshua Tree last week, as you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I brought a very high beam <laughs> flashlight. And just as the light was creeping down, you know, I, I just did it on my light guy. Um, it's just use the just paint light onto the onto the rock surface. A little bit of as if I was burning or dodging. And, real time burn and dodge. Awesome. And it, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. There, there's a, a few um, photographers and FT artists who have been using drones to light. Oh, yeah. landscape and in fact i think i've used one as a pick of the week at some point last year so um there you go that, that my experience has been uh one that that really is very unified with how i approach image editing and cinema editing all right so let's bring this home you are gonna have two releases this year the Reginald the guess. vampire and, and the re-release Christmas. of the Christmas Christmas vacation. vacation. Yeah, brief one, just for a year, for a week. <laughs> it's it's an important week. It's hey, an important week better than a poke in the eye, right? Better than a poke in the eye. Wow, new tools, old methods, new tools, and uh, yeah. And in our in in the picks, uh, I've listed uh, some of those pieces of software. One called Boris. Yeah, we'll we'll put this um, in the uh, in in the show yeah. notes. And All uh, right. that's it. That, well, I that's can't my wait. fun. I can't wait to see both of them. Both of those releases. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, everyone, take care and have a good one. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 